It's the bye week, so we're going position by position to look back at the Falcons' defense so far this year, as well as what's ahead. You are Locked On Falcons, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back, everyone, to another illustrious episode of the Locked On Falcons podcast, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL and use code in all lowercase locked on NFL for your first deposit match up to one hundred dollars. So, guys, if you don't know me, I'm your very humble host, Aaron Freeman. Been covering the Falcons for many years, formerly at Falcfans.com, R.I.P., formerly on Twitter at Falcfans, R.I.P., but still going strong on this illustrious podcast. And of course, you may also know me as Sirius Black and Mr. Drew and all that and more. But, you know, we give a special shout out to the everydayers that make this humble, illustrious podcast their first listen each and every day. Make sure you follow in their footsteps by subscribing and following for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. So like we did the other day, we are going position by position during the bye week as a sort of mini roster review. As I said then, and we'll repeat today, this is not meant to be sort of a comprehensive breakdown of the entire Falcons roster. Those will be saved for the end of the year, probably late January, early February, uh, once we have the full season to go through. But just sort of giving you sort of the vibes so far this season. We'll also look a little bit ahead to what may be in store for the team in the off season as well. So let's start off talking about that front. And, you know, it's all about the pass rush, as we know here in Atlanta. That's all we care about, pass rush, right? And the Falcons have 21 sacks so far this year. That puts them on pace for roughly about 35 for the year, which is about where I projected them. And that would be roughly around league average. So that's a good thing. But then when you, you take a little bit deeper of a look, you see that, you know, nine of those 21 sacks came in two games against Washington and Minnesota. Washington, everybody's been padding their sack numbers against that team as well as the Giants this year. So that feels a little fishy. And then Minnesota, one of those four sacks they had in that game was a tackle for loss from Nate Landman on a HB toss and pass. And then like three of them came in that middle portion of the game when Josh Dobbs first got inserted in the lineup and was kind of just running around trying to figure out the offense. And the Falcons took advantage of it during that stretch of the game. But then as the game wore on, they couldn't take advantage of it. So it does feel like, you know, when you look at the other eight games that the Falcons have played this year, they've only had 12 sacks in those eight games. And that feels more in line with sort of the underwhelming feeling and vibes that the Falcons pass rush has been this year. Now, while the unit as a whole, I think, when you look at the entire pass rush, has been underwhelming, you know, there have been individuals that have stood out, mainly David Onyemata, who's been one of the Falcons' defensive MVPs this year, you know, maybe on a path to a Pro Bowl type of season. You know, it's a little difficult. Again, you need to rack up sack totals usually to make the Pro Bowl. So we'll see if that happens for him. Um, and, you know, his really solid play, you would think, would have led to a, you know, career year from Grady Jarrett. That was kind of the hope that we would have all pro Grady Jarrett this season before he was, you know, sidelined for the rest of the year with that injury. And we didn't quite get that. So that's also kind of contributing to the underwhelming vibe. It's like uh, Grady Jarrett was solid this year, but nothing special uh, in 2023 compared to any of the last five or six years that he has had. Uh, and you could argue that in a lot of ways, 2023 was kind of underwhelming and, and probably one of his weaker seasons compared to some of the last five or six years. Then you look at Calais Campbell, who was sort of the other, you know, part of what we thought was going to be sort of a physical three-headed monster on that defensive line interior. He's been a solid role player, but not a difference maker. You know, he's been outstanding against the run. And overall, you know, even though the pass rush has been underwhelming, you know, the run defense has been one of the better ones in the league. And for a large chunk of the season, depending on what metrics you were looking at, like EPA and whatnot, they were the best run defense in the NFL. May still wind up being that. Uh, don't quite know that. But Overall, when you look at Clayus Campbell, it feels like 2023, at least so far, is going to be kind of a sort of minor footnote, sort of obscure year in a arguably Hall of Fame caliber career that he's had, unless it picks up 
down the stretch. So we'll see about that. The edge rusher group has been underwhelming as well. You know, you look at the projections in terms of what guys are on pace for. Right, is on pace for roughly six sacks. Uh, Bud Dupree's on about five sacks. Lorenzo Carter's about three and a half sacks. And that's roughly in line with what I thought we would get from all three of those guys. You know, somewhere in that three to six sack range uh, for what they would do this upcoming season. But it's been the pressure that has actually been underwhelming. Usually it's the sacks that are underwhelming for the Falcons and the pressure and overwhelming. But those guys haven't generated the type of pressure that you would like, especially because more often than not, it feels like they get their pressure because of scheme. Right. They're not beating guys to get pressure. They're winning off of stunts and twists. You know, they come unblocked on a blitz or something like that. They're getting some cleanup plays or that because the interior guys are sort of flushing the quarterback to them, you know, and that's a contributing factor to why you haven't been hearing me bang the table for, you know, getting more reps for Arnold Abiquetti this year over, you know, Dupree and Carter. Right. You know, maybe he's 10 percent a better pass rusher than those guys are. Maybe, maybe again. That's a, a maybe to me uh, based off of how he's performed this year. But like he's like 20 percent worse as a run defender. So it's like that's part of the reason why the Falcons will give Dupree and Carter more reps in, in their sort of base defense and whatnot. So that's contributing to that. So they're all kind of interchangeable. Obviously, I think AK has more upside than Dupree and Carter because th- those two guys are kind of they are what they are. And there's still potential for AK in the future. But in terms of, you know, their overwhelming value on a per snap basis, you know, they're roughly interchangeable, which is why, like, to me, it doesn't really matter who's getting the, the bulk of the snaps because you're not going to really get that much difference. But, you know, I'm not in I'm not against the idea of, you know, Ebiketti getting more snaps. Um, when you look at the the rest of the rotation, you know, I, I've seen Taquan Graham and Zach Harrison and LaCale London, among others. Uh, you know, I think there's been a slight uptick in their play over the last two or three games, basically since Grady Jarrett got hurt like I basically rather than those guys making zero plays when I'm watching the film like they make one play maybe two plays in a, in a really good game um and that's fine for a back in rotation but you know it's a little underwhelming especially when your frontline guys aren't sort of making the four or five or more plays per game on a consistent you know on Yamada is and in certain games Grady was but nobody else is really doing that and so you know one or two plays is fine if the frontline guys are making four or five plays is basically what I'm saying. And the frontline guys are making like two or three plays and it's like, okay, well, one or two plays isn't moving the needle is basically what I'm saying. So when we look ahead to the offseason, you know, I think this is going to be a position group that's going to get a lot of investment this offseason. You know, I don't think at this rate, Dupree or Campbell are going to be back in Atlanta in 2024. So you're probably looking at at least two starting caliber edge rushers added. Uh, You're probably going to look at another sort of young defensive tackle that the Falcons can kind of start grooming as the heir apparent to Grady Jarrett and David Onyemata, as well as a guy that can be a valuable part of the rotation that can help those guys stay fresh, right? You know, maybe that's Contavious Street, but, you know, I think he could be back, right? But, like, that's kind of the issue with Contavious Street, right? Uh, Like, he's now he should be like the third or fourth guy in a rotation on a D tackle rotation. And that's historically, he's been like the fourth guy. Right. And you know, that's all well and good, but like now he's kind of being asked to be the number two guy for the Falcons due to Grady Jarrett's injury. And and that's, that's probably too much. So it'll be interesting to see how he, you know, if he lives up to those expectations and that, that will merit him sort of coming back and you'll probably see him, you know, right now it feels like he's worth bringing back, but, Again, is that going to be as a three guy? Is that going to be a four guy? Whatever. And you'll see him and Graham and Huggins and all those guys, London, sort of compete for one or two roster spots next year. Carter is a potential cap casualty. Uh, So I I could definitely see the Falcons adding, you know, making significant investments, whether that's early in the draft or with some mid or high upper tier free agents in three or four pieces this offseason. So we'll see about that. And I'm hopefully that will at least bring a somewhat of a smile to Jarvis Davis of locked on sports Atlanta's face this off season, but we'll just sort of have to see, you just kind of expect the Falcons at this point to always disappoint you when it comes to investing, at least Jarvis, you know, I'm fine, but like, you know, Jarvis has a higher standard than I do. Understandably, understandably, but um, that's going to do it for us. When we talk about the front, we're going to move to the linebacker position as we continue this bi-week roster review. But first, guys, I want to tell you about Prize Picks, the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. And now that you have basketball season here, you have 
their new specials league where you can sort of combine projections across different sports, different leagues, you know, NFL, NBA, college basketball, all that more. Right. And for example, on Friday night, if you're so inclined, you can combine Jason Tatum and Shadur Sanders combination of three points made in passing touchdowns. And if you have the skills with prize picks, you can turn $10 into $250 because prize picks is real simple to play. All you got to do is pick two or more players, pick more or less on their projected stats. And the more entries you make, the more money you can make up to 25 times your money. There's quick withdrawals, easy gameplay, enormous selection of players and stats. That's all that makes prize picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL and use code in all lowercase locked on NFL for a first deposit match up to $100. That's prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL. Promo code locked on NFL in lowercase. Price picks is daily fantasy made easy. So, before we talk about the Falcons linebacker, I do want to plug that Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24 7 streaming channel here on YouTube. Locked On Sports Today is here 24 7, covering all sports stories with all the local experts across the Locked On Podcast Network. You're going to get national shows from each and every league. So, go to Locked On Sports Today on YouTube and subscribe for the first ever national sports 24 7 streaming channel. And go check out Locked On Sports Atlanta's 24 7 streaming channel as well so uh linebacker position you know i think the injury to troy anderson kind of derailed this position suffering that peck injury in week three against the detroit lions um i think the falcons have done a pretty solid job sort of piecing it together mostly due to the emergence of nate landman he's been a really solid player that i think projects really well as a high-end backup for the falcons i don't see him as a long-term starter, I know there's a vocal subset of Falcon fans that think he should supplant Troy Anderson and or Caden Ellis as one of the team's two starting inside linebackers. And I, I feel like that's kind of the classic splash play syndrome, which I refer to, which is people tend to focus in on the splash plays, you know, the handful of, you know, sort of big plays, touchdowns, turnovers, all that stuff that and judge players based off of that rather than the larger body of work. Uh, and that's why, you know, I'm a film snob. So I'm all about that larger body of work. But I think when you look at that larger body of work, you, you sort of notice a lot more on film, like Landman's coverage limitations in the Falcons have been trying their best, not so much the last couple of weeks, but you know, maybe that's a contributing factor to why the defense has sort of downturned the last couple of weeks. not blaming Nate, it all on Nate Landman, but it's, I think it could arguably be a contributing factor. Um, you know, why the defense is downturned. They haven't, they've been asking him to play a lot more on, on third downs the last two or three games. Um, and so th the problem is like, because Nate Lemon's a uh, limit, limited speed, he's more of a two down player. And, you know, there's still guys in the league that are quote unquote, two down linebackers that still start games in the NFL. Denzel Perryman is probably the best example. who recently got suspended uh, for, you know, being a headhunter, I guess. Um, but you know, those tend, you know, you look at a player like Denzel Perryman is basically since his rookie contract expired like three or four years ago, has basically been a journeyman type of player. And that's not a player that you build your defense around. So I think the larger point is the Falcons have three solid linebackers once Anderson returns next year. But I do think Anderson and Ellis should definitely be the starters moving forward. Um, Ellis has been asked because of the Anderson injury to take on more of that coverage role because of Nate Landman's limitations. And that's been kind of a square peg in a round hole that doesn't really play to Caden Ellis's strengths, which is mostly his pass rush. And because he's been asked to be more of a coverage guy, we haven't really seen the team un kind of unleash him as a pass rusher outside of two or three games. He was productive in those two or three games where he really got, you know, eight or more snaps to really get after the quarterback, but he hasn't been that sort of dominant force, which is also a contributing factor to why the pass rush has been underwhelming. We, we thought, you know, we talked about this during the offseason, like, hey, you know, there's a possibility that Kane Ellis could be like a, a double digit sack guy if, you know, you could take what he did in those last eight games against the Saints last year and expand that for an entire, uh, you know, 17 game season. But that hasn't come to fruition. So we'll see um, if, you know, the team will be be more trusting of Nate Landman in coverage down the stretch. And maybe that leads to uh, more of an unleashing of Caden Ellis. But, you know, that leads us to the offseason conversation because I, I do think this is going to be a position of need, not necessarily a huge priority for the Falcons because they have more pressing needs. 
But I do think finding that fourth linebacker, you know, Tay Davis, Andre Smith weren't the guys, someone that can be more of that coverage guy so that in the event of another injury to, say, Troy Anderson or to any of these other guys, that they won't be sort of forced to have to kind of make it work, you know, square pegging Caden Ellis or, or whatever the case may be. You know, they can let Nate Lamb be a two down guy and be an exceptional two down guy because they have a, another guy that can come in and sort of offset some of those limitations in coverage. So I think that will be, you know, something that the Falcons could find a cheap veteran in free agency or more likely a sort of day three draft pick. Um, you know, that can be that coverage guy, also contribute on special teams, all that stuff and more. So I think shoring up the depth at the linebacker position is going to be a higher priority than probably your average fan thinks, who just sort of looks like and says, oh, we got three pretty good guys here, you know, we're good. And it's like, you know, I think you need to shore up the depth, but it's not going to be as big a priority as some of these other positions. One position group that may take a bigger priority this offseason, depending on how things go, especially given, you know, several guys like Jeff Okuda and AJ Terrell are competing for, you know, big money contracts is that secondary. So that's what we'll talk about to wrap up today's locked on Falcons by week breakdown. So guys, it's tough to root for your favorite team on an empty stomach. And that's where DoorDash can help you out. Right. My favorite wing spot, my local wing spot called uh tasty stop uh, here in Durham, North Carolina, uh, you know, is on DoorDash. It's is DoorDash exclusive. And so I love ordering, you know, a dozen hot teriyaki, honey, garlic, pepper, lemon, pepper, all that and more type of wings from there. And your local faves are also found on DoorDash, whether you're looking for restaurant stores, grocery, retail, all that and more. So you can get game day ready as I have often had ordering Tasty Stop before a Falcons game on Sunday. And, you know, I'm a longtime user of DoorDash, so I don't get the benefit of this promo code that we offer for you guys because this is for first-time users, but I could easily get 50% off up to a $10 value when I spend $15 or more on my first order. Uh, when I download the DoorDash app and enter code LOCK23, subject to change terms apply, you know, that would get me roughly, you know, 10, 15 wings, a nice little discount. So you find whatever you want to get that discount on and use that promo code LOCKED23 and you'll get 50% off up to a $10 value when you spend $15 or more on your first order when you download the DoorDash app and enter that code LOCKED23. Subject to change, terms apply. So guys, you know, obviously today is, as many of you guys are checking this out, this is an extra bonus episode, you know, the sixth episode of the week, as opposed to uh, the usual five. And obviously the next episode that we're going to probably do is Sunday evening, our usual post-game rapid reaction. But because the Falcons aren't playing on Sunday due to the bye week, uh, I think we'll probably wind up doing a mock draft Monday. Um, so I'll put together probably a full 32 pick first round and then we'll take a deeper look into some options for the falcons in you know in those first couple of rounds so that will be something to look forward to on sunday evening as well as monday morning here as your first listen here on lockdown falcons so let's wrap up today's episode talking about the defensive backs in the secondary which i think has been the strength of the falcons defense uh that through the first you know seven or ish games when the defense was playing well and we weren't complaining about the defense Right. Um, I think it was because the secondary was playing so well. You know, Jeff Akuda has played well this year uh, since coming back from his injury. You know, I still have some issues with some blown coverages that he has in zone. Uh, but outside of, you know, a handful, and it's really only manifested itself again over the last three or so games. So, again, not to put it on Nate Landman, you know, that's a contributing factor to, I think, some of the issues the defense has had in recent weeks. But, um, Outside of that, like he's been lights out. And frankly, like my charting of the defense in terms of when teams target him, teams are less effective targeting him this year than they are A.J. Terrell. Uh, and speaking of A.J. Terrell, he's also been very good, right? I think Akuda has definitely, for the most part, again, outside of a couple of plays here that he, he can definitely clean up, has lived up to the billing of being that high in number two corner opposite A.J. Terrell. I think A.J. Terrell has looked like a number one corner. I know somebody in the discord and uh, mentioned that AJ has struggled this year. And I was like, I, I don't think that's true. Again, I think he had a bad game against Tampa Bay against Mike Evans. Terry McLaurin kind of gave him a little bit of an issue in that, that Washington game. But outside of that, he's been very good. I think the problem is going back to that splash play syndrome 
where you remember the, the blown coverages and the touchdowns that he gave up to Hopkins and, and Calvin Ridley. And you think that's sort of, you know, what has been the norm this season and it hasn't that's that those represent a, a very small handful of plays like basically one percent of his plays and the other 99 percent of the time aj terrell's lights out but it's kind of the nature of being a corner being um you know offensive tackles also have to deal with this sort of people only focus on the one percent of bad and not the 99 percent of good that's basically the jake matthews story uh you know that's his that's his uh autobiography is like a one percent bad 99 percent good uh but you know i think aj has definitely played at a high level i don't know if he's played at a high enough level where i would feel comfortable with what we talked about going in the season as him potentially being the highest paid corner in the nfl right you know, I think he's played at a level where he certainly can has made his case to be a top five highest paid corner, maybe the fourth or fifth highest paid corner, but in terms of number one. So like that would basically be like, OK, Trayvon Diggs money at like 19 and a, 19 million and a half or 19. Yeah, 19 and a half million. Sorry, I can't speak. 19 and a half million per year. That makes sense for A.J. Terrell. The 21 plus million, which is what Jair Alexander gets paid as the highest paid corner in the league. Yeah. I haven't seen that level of AJ Durrell, but you know, we'll see how the rest of the season plays out. There's still seven games to go. There's going to be several high level number one receivers that the Falcons face uh, after the bye. that if AJ Terrell, same goes for Jeff Okuda. If these guys can lock those guys down, that's going to definitely potentially enhance their market value. So I think the Falcons starters have been solid. Even if, you know, there's a couple of plays. I'm like, mm, I don't know about that. You know, like that's basically what it is for both Jeff Okuda and AJ Terrell. It's just like a couple of plays. I'm like, mm, ah, I don't like that. But, you know, I think when you look at the nickel quarterback, D, D Alfred has been solid. We'll see uh, how he finishes out the season. Uh, but if he just maintains, that's, you know, that's one of the better number three corners that the Falcons have had over the last decade. Plus um, we'll see what happens with Clark Phillips he, right now you know, where he kind of fits in behind D Alford remains to be seen right now. He, he kind of looks more like he's going to be the long-term backup behind D Alford rather than a starter, but there's a lot of games left to be played this season. And just because right now it looks like he's stuck behind D Alford doesn't mean that a year from now, that's going to be the case. Because when you look back at the last 15 years of the Falcons nickel cornerback spot, that has been a revolving door of a position where you can be like a Robert McClain and play really well in 2012 and then fall off the next year. And then all of a sudden that opens the door for somebody else to, to come in. And, and as that was with Josh Wilson in 2014, uh, as we saw then, but we'll, we'll see how that all plays out in the future. But so far, so good at that nickel cornerback spot. At the safety position, Jesse Bates, similar to David Onyemata, has been one of the MVPs of the defense, has played at an all-pro caliber level. You know, his play has kind of dipped the last couple of weeks, but it was so he set the bar so high that even though I don't think he's played poorly or anything, it's just been a couple of like, you know, hey, that's not that's not the Jesse Bates that was, you know, you know, an elite player uh the last couple of weeks and again it's only a handful of plays that have led to that so just you know a couple of blown coverages a couple of missed tackles things that he can clean up definitely so hopefully he'll excuse me pick that up after the bye week looking at the other safety spot you know richie grant we talked about this with jarvis the other day on the podcast or yesterday on the podcast as i'm sure many of you guys are listening to this um you know we talked about that extensively he's been a disappointment now i don't think richie grant has been all bad i think he's had some ups and downs and if you could argue that the downs or let's say in Richie Grant's case, instead of 1% of his plays being bad, it's like 2% or 3% of his plays being bad, which is probably accurate uh, when you look at, you know, the 10,000 snaps that he's probably played this year. Um, You know, the problem, unlike AJ Terrell, where even if it wasn't a 99% to 1% ratio, his 99% doesn't look that good, right? Like it's just not full of like, super impressive play like it is with AJ Terrell or like it is with Jake Matthews when they're just kind of like locking down their guys. Right. Uh, and you know, we thought Jesse, we thought Jesse Bates's presence would lead to Richie Grant being better. It would allow Richie Grant to be more aggressive, make more plays. He's been more aggressive. It hasn't led to him making all the plays that comes with that. And so I think that's been the problem, you know, that's the aggressiveness on the biting on the double moves and stuff like that has been a problem this year. So, 
And then you couple with the other stuff that he's been asked to do, whether it's been a tight end eraser. And we saw that really come to a head against the Cardinals. Although prior to that, like I wouldn't say it was a huge problem, but it was just like, it was okay when he would be asked to cover tight ends and man coverage. And then as a run defender, he hasn't really been that much of a difference maker. I felt like he was better in that capacity last year than he has been this year. So um, you know, he's just not making up for it. Like the the you you can live with a little bit of the Richie Grant roller coaster if you're getting the positive and the negative plays, right? It's kind of like Kayla McGarry in the past, not so much this year, where it's like if you're giving me elite run blocking, I can live with you just being an average to below average pass protector, right? That's kind of what you're hoping for, Richie Grant, and we're not getting that. Um, and we're not getting that from Kayla McGarry, but go listen to the other episode to get more into that. But um I think this is going to lead to potentially when we look to the offseason, two potential tweaks that the Falcons may have um, or two potential upgrades that outside corner and adding more safety depth. But, you know, I think because of Richie Grant's struggles, the, the question has been, do the Falcons make a change? I don't think they I don't the, to me, there's no real justification justification for benching Richie Grant just because I don't think Micah Hel- uh, DeMarco Helms, I'm sorry, not Micah Abernathy, DeMarco Helms. I think he's limited player especially in coverage and so i don't think he's solving your coverage issues right so i think the way that you probably potentially solve your coverage issues is with the dime defense that the falcons overwhelmingly play on third downs you either decide to put trey flowers out there as your tight end eraser which is the role that trey flowers played with the Bengals and was effective and i won't say he was like great in that role but he was effective in that role in cincinnati the last two years as a dime safety or dime defender or if you're insisting on you know and so you play with like four corners and and, and three and two safeties in your dime or you you still stick with the three corners and three safeties and i think you make micah abernathy that third safety because i just think he's going to give you more in coverage than demarco hellams is and that to me could help mitigate some of the richie grant issues Potentially. So we'll, we'll see about that. But when we look to the offseason, I do think the Falcons may potentially be looking, despite how good the secondary has been, building on this strength to find two starting caliber players, potentially at both corner and safety. Right. The safety is to potentially push Richie Grant if he doesn't necessarily rebound next year. Right. Uh, someone to come in and compete with him uh, and or potentially replace him. And then the the cornerback, you're looking for some d- depth at the outside corner. Even in a world where you successfully bring back Jeff Akuda, right? You don't want to have a situation like you had this year where you're relying on Mike Hughes or Trey Flowers to back him up. You want to have, you know, sort of your Alante Taylor to to borrow uh, uh, the Saints when Marshawn Lattimore and, and others have been down uh, the last couple of years. So finding that player, probably drafting that player, makes a ton of sense uh, for me. But you know, obviously. One of the questions you're going to have is, do you re-sign Jeff Okuda, who's going to be a free agent uh, after the season? And, you know, that remains an an unopened, unanswered question. Um, you know, I feel like he's played well enough so far this year that he should get a competitive offer from the Falcons. Whether that offer is competitive enough to keep him in Atlanta remains to be seen. Depends on who else hits the market. Depends on how well Akuda plays over the next seven games, if he stays healthy, all that stuff and more. Don't. It's really hard to guess the cornerback market because a lot of times guys will be starters and they'll settle for like one-year deals. Um, and then you'll get the one guy that gets the big long-term contract. And like, you know, my assumption would be like the Falcons would be more inclined to give AJ Terrell that big long-term contract and try to get Jeff Akuda on a one-year deal, but someone else could come in and, and sign Akuda to a long-term deal. Again, those are unanswered questions at this point in time. And so we'll just have to wait and see how that all plays out, but that's going to do it for us on our bi-week breakdown. Again, our next episode should be a mock draft Monday coming at you Sunday night as well as Monday morning on your preferred podcast platform. So continue to make Locked On Falcons your first listen. Check out Locked On NFL as your second listen. Check out Locked On Sports Today, Locked On Sports Atlanta for your 24-7 streaming channels. That's going to do it for us, guys. I hope you have a great Falcons-free and stress-free weekend. Enjoy your bye week. Eat some chicken wings. Do whatever you got to do to uh, you know enjoy yourself because we're going to be right back to the grind of you know lamenting this stinking football team <laughs> all week long so you know and take these couple of days off enjoy yourself and then we'll be get back into this thing so appreciate it guys till then